The opening sequence of episode 38, much like the very first one I suppose, gives up all subtlety and just drops us right on the shore. You know, the thing we've been working toward ever since the start of season 1? I think I'm not alone in saying that when I saw this dreamy, peaceful scene with those familiar seagull songs and the calm waves hitting the shore, I was very much doing a double take. Not helped by the fact that air and shadow that we see here is ripped right out of the season 2 ending. Something that very much solidifies this as reality and not some hazy vision or dream. Another important note is that it continues the theme of cyclicality in the story. Season 1 started with the Colossal lumbering over the wall, and it ends with one within the wall. It started with Eren waking up on a flowery field alongside Mikasa, and it ends with Eren waking up with those same purple flowers alongside Mikasa. Season 2 opens with the Beast Titan, it ends with the Beast Titan. It opens with a flashback to Eren's mom, it ends with a continuation of that same flashback. And so now Season 3 opens with the shore, and will end on that same shore. Just like Eren's fate of waking up from the long dream time and time again. Each season establishes a cyclical narrative that, again, solidifies this vision as the absolute truth. Another thing to note is the wider framing of this entire sequence. We left off Season 2 with us barely even getting away. And while Erwin certainly seemed confident that they've made a huge leap toward the truth, opening up the season with, again, the most dreamy scene imaginable certainly leaves you asking many questions as to what happens in between. Another thing to note is the parallels to the final season, particularly with the color scheme and the framing of the sequence. Notice the super vibrant color palette that's used here. And also note the bloom on everything that gives the scene this warm and hazy feel as we see those two birds flying in freedom. But we then cut to the opening scene of the final season. There are no calm waves hitting the shore, no seagull songs, it's just a lone bird circling a dead and dry battlefield of non-stop destruction. First off, the birds going from 2 to 1 I think can be interpreted as the separation of Eren and either just Mikasa or just about everyone else. I think both interpretations make sense here considering Eren does go off solo. You can even take it to be a separation within Eren himself, with the bird that has been left behind representing his humanity. And fret not, once we get to season 4, botanist Kuroto will take a quick break and ornithologist Kuroto will make his debut. Yes, we will talk about birds, for probably a long time. Though secondly, the visual contrast of this peaceful coast and the war-ridden battlefield brings up the question of, did the dream turn out to be a nightmare? Again, we'll be touching on this plenty more, so keep that in mind for now. Also, also, this is something I kind of flew over in the first episodes because we only really talked about the whole salt trade aspect, but Armin's book mentioning the ocean was of course another big hint toward the truth of the world. They didn't just call it some huge body of water, they explicitly said ocean, something they technically should not be aware of unless someone knew what the difference between a sea and an ocean is. So this is just a confirmation of that. The dub, though, actually does change the wording and Aaron just says, Lies a great expanse of water. He called it the sea. Which I do think adds this interesting dimension of there just being a gap in language. I find that very neat. And coincidentally, we'll have another very, very similar example of this later in the episode. And lastly, I just have to give huge props to Aaron's voice actors for this scene. Oh, and actually, also, 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 before we get to that, Aaron obviously also has longer hair, so there's already an implied time skip further adding to the belief that this is not a vision or anything. Why would Aaron envision himself sometime in the future, but not so distant future, right? But yes, both the sub and dub voice actors just nail that hollow sounding, almost regretful and painful tone. With Aaron, we of course know that much of this is a direct result of what happens in the Crystal Catacombs and later him literally seeing the rumbling. But in terms of themes, it's just that moment of, wait, it's over. For us, we are not aware of any future seeing shenanigans. It's just that that dream that seemed unattainable, one you fought for your entire life, is here. So what now? Suddenly, there is no purpose and that leaves you with the question, maybe I never actually wanted to get here. We'll be talking plenty about the Aaron situation as we get further into this arc and this same theme would be explored with Astoria in this very episode. But in terms of a season opener, I distinctly remember being like, oh my god, it's finally time, Attack on Titan Season 3, let's pop off, and this is the cold open. I think I just lost my mind at that moment. Wait, 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 wait. And on a very similarly surprising note, we of course get a new opening for Season 3. That of course being the ever iconic, and I know many many people's favorite, Red Swan. I think the quickest way to summarize my immediate thoughts on this one is with that meme of anime OPs usually being super intense and action-y, while the EDs are super sad. 
Well, this one obviously falls outside of those usual expectations. Much of this opening, and really season 3 as a whole, is waking up from that somewhat ignorant and innocent dream that the walls had been living thus far and beginning to accept the truths that we've learned of and would continue to learn throughout the upcoming arcs. Something that I think is very neatly conveyed through the constant contrastings of their childhoods. For some, that naivety would begin to crumble away, while for others, it would just be uncovering a long-forgotten truths. This extends to many of our core players. From Aaron's trio and their joyful adventures before the wall fell, to Levi's far darker childhood in the underground, to even Aaron's pursuit of truth. The first shot we get in this opening is of Aaron, with him seeming almost dreamy and distant, flying with the ODM gear with impossible grace. We deliberately focus on the Wings of Freedom that are now being contrasted to the first OPs where Aaron was still in his plain cadet uniform. As with most things, symbolism will of course depend on the culture in question, but in Japanese culture, swans are generally used to convey just that. Beauty, purity, and elegance, all of which are leveraged to remind us of where this dream began. At this point, I have sort of accepted that I'll be making a separate video on the OPs as they're just super dense, but if you want to quickly dip into some mild overanalyzing, in Germanic mythology, there are also plenty of stories that bear an almost uncanny resemblance to the true Amir story in Attack on Titan all of which revolve around that wounded swan. And speaking of that, I think the most important part of the opening hides in the red swan parts. The lyrics of, as you spread your bloodstained wings, might be telling us that we are waking up from an ignorant dream and pursuing freedom and truth, but at what cost? A swan might be a symbol of elegance, but this one is stained in blood. Aaron's impossibly graceful flight with the ODM gear, that piano in the background giving the entire scene this almost ethereal peaceful tone. But he himself wears a mask because he has learned the truth. He is the Red Swan. His wings are now stained in blood. On a similar note, notice the contrasting between the trio's childhoods and the presents. Back then, they were climbing up to the roof, all struggling and helping each other. Whereas now, Aaron is flying alone while Mikasa and Armin are just waiting for him. Again depicting the distance that we see between them in these following arcs, and of course plenty more throughout the entire final season. This is not the Season 1 OP where we all band together as one and become the Hunters. This is not the Season 2 one which is all about dedicating our hearts for the cause. No, this one begins to paint Aaron's fights as a very lonely one. Not yet to the extent of Season 4 where he is quite literally alone, but even here, the distance is already visible. Also, the vocals in this one are just beautiful. But in the context of Attack on Titan, and especially in the context of the final season, it more so leads into the beautiful tragedy, if that makes sense. Especially with some of the almost surreal moments of his story and Frida. It's almost like this parallel depiction, a dream, of what could have been if the truth hadn't been so dark. This too, I think, is echoed in the lyrics of What's the lie? What's the truth? What to believe? followed by these ripples that are just about the most universal depiction of memories. Something that would of course play a huge role in his stories and Aaron's narratives. While the overarching theme of Season 3 is the pursuit of truth, for Aaron, that comes with the question of, can I even believe what I'm seeing? He watches himself commit unspeakable atrocities. And so, that truth, that dream, was it just some twisted nightmare all along? Also, the lines of, like a fallen angel, I drift helplessly through the winds of time. First off, you know another word for fallen angels? Sinners, or straight up the devil. So with the focus on Aaron and him later straight up being named Devil's Child, I mean, they even named the rumbling episode Sinners, all of this is setting up that immense juxtaposition of the dreamy music and this elegance of a swan as Aaron flies to the unimaginable horrors that he'd actually witness. Also, Kid Aaron bumping into the adult Aaron, who doesn't even flinch, again depicts the lack of attachment to anything that we already saw in the opening sequence and his completely monotone voice, as well as everything we'd see post historious coronation. Also, also, the second part of that line, helplessly drifting through the winds of time, Aaron is in a fixed time loop, so he is helplessly drifting through time. He wakes up under the tree, the story happens, he dies during the rumbling, and he wakes up from his long dream under that same tree all over again. Rinse and repeat. And of course, because this is Attack on Titan, the final line of fly to heaven as we see the keep again reminds us that all of this is about the basements. It's those exact truths that would indeed see Aaron fly above the clouds, just not in the way he probably envisioned. As for the title of the episode, Smoke Signal, I think there are a couple of interpretations. 
Firstly, it's Aaron's Titan Steam Smoke thingy that ends up working as a pseudo-smoke signal for Kenny's squad and outing their whole operation. It's obviously not quite a smoke signal per se, but functionally, it does turn out to be one. Though a slightly different, and definitely more over-analysis interpretation, would be Levi's and Hanji's suspicions over everything going on. As in the saying of, where there's smoke, there's fire. We'll get to this later in the episode, but on both sides we see them begin to notice a number of quite alarming hints that there is a far grander conspiracy going on. Or, in other words, noticing the smoke signal. Moving into the episode itself, we open the season with Eren's very cursed squad once again being isolated from everyone else. This time, not because we are harboring potential titan shifters, but because rather we hold 1. a royal who is potentially instrumental to figuring out the secrets of the walls, and 2. someone with the ability to literally control titans. So yeah, this squad? Definitely cursed. Jokes aside though, this entire sequence achieves a number of different things. First off, the practical. It is extremely efficient in reminding us of where these characters stand, their personalities, and the time they've shared together. It's no coincidence that Sasha and Jean immediately talk about her trying to join food, Aaron starts fuming that Levi would be mad if they trucked in mud, Mega Giga Sigma Chad Mikasa casually shows up having chopped firewood even with her injuries, Aaron then laughs saying that she was also doing sit-ups to which Jean responds with his jealousy-filled rage and calls him a peeper. All of these things just remind people who don't spend every waking minute obsessing over the show of the existing relationships and character dynamics. Though secondly, and this is obvious but kind of easy to zoom past, the whole vibe of them reminiscing about their early cadet days and generally just relaxing immediately tells us that there was no immediate retaliation by Reiner Berchel toward the big monkey. But Aaron and the others still cleaning also tells us that it hasn't been that long since everything went down. And it's these two things that sort of plant us in this odd limbo period of sort of expecting the battle to continue but also having this internal conspiracy to worry about. Unlike Season 2, which happens over the course of like 2-3 to three days, Season 3 is a bit more spaced out, with a larger time jump happening right before the Shiganshin arc. But all of this just creates this very weird sense of uneasy peace, if you will. And in a very similar vein, it also marks the final time where you could just relax, just like the good old days. In but a week, Historia would no longer be their good buddy and squad mates, she would be their queen, and not just that, Aaron and her would share a terrible secret that could quite literally reshape the world. Though as they're still bickering and yoinking food and whatnot, the man himself, Levi, enters the room and gives them the good old stink eye for not having cleaned fast enough. Which again, a small reminder of Levi's character, as well as a bit of a lighter note to start things on, since, well, you know. Though he then notes that Hanji wants to continue with Eren's Titan experiments, and that's exactly what we see, with us jumping right to Eren's Howling Titan, which is all kinds of messed up. The sub here, for some reason, omits Levi saying, Third time. Which I think is an important bit of context for this whole thing. It's not that Eren just can't transform, it's that his body is progressively getting weaker and weaker and weaker with each subsequent transformation. Something that turns out to be a huge turning point in the attack on Liberio. It's exactly that endurance that would eventually lead to his victory. I think you can definitely infer it from the visual cues as is, but the dub adding that one extra line I think is a good call. But more importantly for Season 3 and what we are up to right now, note that the lower part of his body specifically is severely underdeveloped and just barely form bones. We know that the Titan forms around the wielder, so his torso being the most developed makes sense. And for Eren, this is merely a result of exhaustion. But remember that we would have another, not entirely developed and abnormal Titan later in the season with Rod Rice. So for now, just keep this little factoid stashed away in your Attack on Titan lore books. But in a broader sense, I always like that we got to see some of these little moments of them actually trying to understand how and why things like Titans operate. It is still a story, so of course there are still surprise moments like Eren just activating the coordinates out of the blue. But the plan of plugging up the wall has been brewing ever since Season 2 began. So scenes like this just really ground the narrative and make that eventual triumph carry even more weight because it's not as simple as just showing up and it works. No, we actually had to learn first. Oh, and like, yeah, in case you forgot, the story of Season 2 originally began with recapturing Shiganshin. The whole thing was just derailed by a certain monkey who really likes baseball and his two friends. Lore aside though, the scene of Eren being yoinked out of the Titan and Hanji just immediately screaming, Oh god, his face, quick do a sketch of Eren's face, is the most Hanji thing ever, and Hanji's just the goat. Also, and this is something we'd see very explicitly in just a moment, but note that Historia has already grown a lot more distant and cold. 
with her expressions being just about as unchanging as Levi's. Though as they briefly discuss the results of the tests and the whole plan of plugging up the wall with Aaron's hardening, they also immediately note that they need to hide their tracks and make it look like no one was here. This time around, it's not that we are isolating Aaron's squad from the outside world, is that we are isolating the outside world from Aaron's squad. So in that sense, we just have a nice inversion there, even down to their hair colors, isn't that interesting? Unfortunately though, they are not so lucky, because just as they wrap up their experiments, we zoom out to see two individuals with very interesting looking hats, looking at the rising smoke steam thingy, clearly exposing their location, and making it very easy to track Aaron down. So from this point onward, we are operating with some information asymmetry. Everyone in the universe is well aware that people are probably looking for them, it's just that we know that they are actually a lot closer than they expect. Though with that, Levi, Hanji, and Astoria all ride to Trost to catch Erwin up on everything that has been going on, giving us a, another sort of a parallel to Levi's first escort mission of Erwin, with him now having to watch over the equally mysterious Astoria Rice. I'm sure she's a lot less of a headache to deal with than Erwin though, so I'm sure he's not complaining. As we cut on to Levi and Erwin talking though, we start to get some additional lore bombs about Astoria. Also, tiny, purely practical detail, I know, but we are again reminded of the whole Krista, no Astoria correction Levi pulls here. I just find it really interesting how efficient they are about these reminders. Erwin says he looked into her file, saying that she's the illegitimate daughter of Lord Rice, and then adding that her life story is truly a miserable one. Something that unfortunately holds true for just about everyone we know, and something we already got glimpses of with the new opening. As far as Astoria goes though, if you've watched anything like Game of Thrones or something, you'll know that illegitimate sons slash daughters are always a powder keg just waiting to go off. So even from that single sentence, you should already have a very good idea that something must have changed for them to suddenly pursue her. As far as we know, there is not a succession crisis or anything like that. So whatever happened in Season 2 must have changed something. The answer to that is kinda twofold. Number one actually hides in the mid-card we talked about in the Season 2 finale, with information on the Shifters now being formally declassified and Titans being revealed as human in origin. This shift from being some divine judgement or force of nature naturally shifts the power structure of the walls, because there is now an enemy we can fight and actually defeat, and once the truth comes out, well, the church is just a fairy tale. But much more importantly, number two, Eren's activation of the coordinates which is of course exactly what the rest of the royal government arc would be about. We'll be talking about this plenty more later on, but a question that often pops up right away is why didn't Rod just yoink Aaron as soon as he transformed? Sure, he didn't technically know that he had the Founding Titan, but he knows that Grisha got it, he has a rough estimate of Aaron's age and a rough idea of when Aaron must have acquired his Titan, since, well, he's still alive. And he is also pulling all the strings alongside the crown and has more than enough resources to yoink just about anyone. So even if yoinking Eren was still a gamble as he could just be some other titan and not the founding titan, why didn't he do so? Well, the thing is, he did pull him as fast as possible and even with the resources he does have, the one and most important resource he is lacking is spinal fluid. That's exactly why we had to choose who we would save. Not just that, he first had to find where Historia even ended up, something he didn't really need to rush as no one knew her true name. That is, until he learned that Nick had been yoinked, following which everything kicked right into gear as her name could now be out there. And big surprise, that is exactly what we saw in Season 2. Problem is, Season 2 is, again, like 2-3 to three days. So while it might have seemed like a lot of time to us, it would quite literally be impossible to get them. Like, unless they just marched right on top of the scouts, there was just no way they could be faster than them. And also, another concern is kind of just that, actually keeping things low-key. Remember that in Season 1, Eren was almost given up to the MPs for dissection. That dissection would be exactly what we see in Season 3. If it wasn't for Zachary and Erwin, Eren along with his two titans would almost certainly be force-fed to Historia. In the tribunal, when we saw Nick saying all of that nonsense about undermining the sanctity of the walls and whatnot, while he's obviously not entirely aware of how all of this works, it was still trying to avoid this sort of outcome. According to the wall religion, absolutely no one should possess the power of the titans. The MPs, on the other hand, well, all of them are working for Rod. And Rod knows exactly what he wants with the titans. Again, just like with the Tribunal way back in Season 1, for the sake of not repeating myself a dozen different times, we'll be talking about all of this once we actually get to the Crystal Catacombs. 
But like the super TLDR version is just that information is now coming out and pushing everything into high gear. But Erwin then wonders, how is it that some random lord knows the secret of the walls? Well, now the answer is simple. He's not just some lord, he is the true royal bloodline. And to immediately give us a almost direct response to that inquiry, we cut to Nick chilling in a small room where he gets a knock on the door and is obviously yoinked. So yeah, church and state mixing, very very bad. Returning to our nice little cabin though, we get a number of really interesting scenes. We first see Aaron just once again blaming himself, while Mikasa tries telling him to stop and that it's not his fault. This whole sentiment holds true right up until the final season, and I think the lyrics of Under the Tree capture that very very well. Annoying pain in my head, things left unsaid. I'm sorry, we have been relying on you too much to be free. That is obviously Mikasa talking to Aaron. Without getting stuck in the weeds too much, this constant indebtedness to each other I think is something that is severely underappreciated in AOT, because it always just felt super realistic to me. Aaron has stated multiple times that he wishes to be like Mikasa or even Reiner, as in wanting to be strong and dependable. I mean, just about every time he has been in trouble, it is either Mikasa, Armin or someone else coming to save him, so yes, he does rely on them. But on the flip side, Mikasa too, and I think rightfully so, says that they do rely on his titan ability. In Trost, he literally carried a boulder on his shoulders through the entire district. It's just that core human insecurity of always feeling like you owe someone that I think is captured really well here. It doesn't really matter what that quote-unquote exchange looks like because it's not rational. It's a purely emotional sense of always feeling lesser. And I also think that is exactly what Aaron would exploit later in Season 4, but okay, let's not get into that now. Also, again, a practical writing thing, Connie just so happens to remind us of the big monkey saying that he wants to take it down for what happened in Ragako. Though because this is overanalyzing, note that he actually calls him an ape, something that Paradeep technically shouldn't know of. The dub, on the other hand, changes the wording to be just... That hairy bastard took everything from me. But from my very scientific Google Translate research, Saru is ape in Japanese, and I'm pretty sure he also says... That could be a very minor plot hole of language again, or it might be them adopting Eren's language based on what he heard Amir say. But on the flip side again, there they said monkey, not ape. So, I don't know. Suppose I was always working with a knowledge buff compared to the dub viewers, because the language the sub uses is, for better or worse, a lot more specific, and sometimes maybe even too much so. How much you wanna bet there's already a way the dub is cringe comment below? And as much as I joke about it, it does actually make me wonder how theory crafting was shaped by these differences. No matter what very angry people on the internet like to say, I do think there's a very large and far less outspoken part of the community that does wait for the dubs and only then get to discussing the show. So it makes me wonder how these slight moments of information disparity might have shaped the way people think about the world of Attack on Titan. And to be fair, this also extends to the subtitles, it feels like every single streaming site has their own subtitles for Attack on Titan. So yes, if you are a dub only viewer, do let me know whether there was some sort of information disparity because I was keeping up with the subtitles so I genuinely don't know. Getting back on track though, much like the final scene of Season 2, this just realigns our sights on the monkey as the next big bad. And it also shows us that even the wacky goofy Connie has seen enough to make even him cold. Also, fun detail, note that when we cut to Sasha in the lookout tower, alongside the musket slash flintlock slash thingy gun they use, she also has her bow, which is of course a nod to her flashback and her accepting her roots. And of course, as we'd see, it's not even a temporary thing, she also has it later in the episode. But as they switch out the patrols, we get a moment between Aaron and Astoria. And right from the get-go, the immediate question that always pops up with these two, and season 3 in general, how in the seven hells did they literally never touch, and if they did, why didn't Aaron just get blasted by memories immediately? Well, first off, and maybe this is just me being the most introverted person on the planet, and maybe it's just a culture thing, but saying that, I think in Japanese culture, physical contact is even more rare than here in Latvia. But whatever the case, I just don't think it's actually that big of a stretch at all. Now, if this was a French series, then sure, but it's mostly based in a mixture of German and Japanese cultures. So I don't think it's actually that far out of the range of possibility that they never actually make any sort of direct physical contacts. The only major exception is probably like boot camp or something where you just might have situations where you need to help each other out or something like that. But wait, don't leave that comment just yet because that's beside the point. We do actually have scenes like this and I'm sure many others where they do in fact touch and nothing happens. What I think is the more important factor here is intent. 
Remember that the power of the Attack Titan is still held by the future Inheritor. That is why Grisha can never just freely peer into Eren's memories at will. It is Eren who controls the memories. So the way I see it is that when Eren kisses Historia's hand during the coronation, I think it's a mixture of him having fulfilled the prerequisites, if you will, of learning of the basement, seeing the memories of his father, and building the backstory, and only then future Eren is like, okay, you know how we got here, now let me show you the future and guide you toward that future. Again, for like the 100th time, all of this is just still set up, so we'll be talking plenty more about this as we actually get to all of that. But point is, I don't think the memory transfer is as easy as some people make it out to be. I don't think it's a case of Eren like high-fiving Historia and suddenly being just blasted by memories of the rumbling. Though Historia then mutters, it must be nice to at least have a goal. Saying that it might be hard, but at least they have a guiding star. Again, remember the opening sequence. Eren too would reach his guiding star. And that's when things got really, really, really dark. As for Historia though, this of course sets up her arc of finding a new purpose. After losing Amir, she is understandably in a very, very dark place. And considering she was already jumping at the opportunity to become a martyr, the Crystal Catacombs would play an instrumental role in her story and ascension to the throne. This is, again, me sort of jumping ahead a little, but I think there's a very good reason why we have three separate EDs that you can stitch together and explore the dark fates of Historia, Eren, and Mikasa. All three of them are unfortunately intertwined in the depressing narrative that is Attack on Titan. But okay, more on that next time. But Eren then says that, at least she's finally talking, saying that this real Historia is far better. This is certainly a stretch I know, but it does kind of make me wonder whether the Titan Shifters can actually see through Historia's bubbly disguise because of some pseudo-link there. Emir obviously clocked her immediately. Eren also says that he was kind of creeped out by her constant happiness. The Marley Squad are a bit harder to read, especially Reiner who is, well, you know. But considering the Titans are meant to sort of serve the Royals, perhaps there is some sort of supernatural link there and he does sort of have an idea of what his story is actually feeling. But okay, weird fantasy shenanigans that frankly make no sense aside. I think it's here where Historia and Eren really connect, with both of them now carrying a equally heavy burden. Sure, Eren does still have Mikasa and Armin, but much like Historia carries the weight of being a royal, Eren is a Titan who is currently tasked with effectively saving humanity. Post time skip, we'd of course see the bond be even stronger, but also more strained. With Eren turning the entire world against himself, something that Historia knows all too well. As of right now though, it's just a nice scene of them catching up and generally just being good buddies. You know what that means, right? In Attack on Titan, we have the law of inequivalent change. One happy and wholesome scene means about 500 depressing ones, so get ready. But Eren then suddenly remembers Emir and Burrito talking about something. He later gives a transcript to Hanji, and it's hard to say exactly what he's referring to, but the scene that is spliced in here is Emir talking about Marcel, something that is of particular interest to Eren since he keeps getting glimpses of a syringe and his papa later poofing into thin air, because, well, he ate him. And this would also be of significant importance in regard to Historia since he'd be trying to ensure that, one, she doesn't get eaten, and two, doesn't become a shifter herself. Though in classic Attack on Titan fashion, we are cut off as Hanji and the others arrive with the unfortunate news that Pastor Nick is dead. The flashback scene we get of them going to the crime scene is one of those super dense scenes we get in Attack on Titan. They say it's a robbery, but his nails were pulled, clearly tipping off that it was a, let's say, enhanced interrogation. The dude is from the first interior squad, meaning they were specifically sent down here from the capital to yoink him. Where there's smoke, there's fire. Hanji grabs his hand, first noticing that it's covered in bruises. Again, enhanced interrogation. And two, he himself immediately jumps to talking about the church when no one ever mentioned the church. Hanji says they actually put him down as a carpenter. Basically, all of this is just a series of honeypots trying to bait him into revealing something that he shouldn't technically know, but clearly, we know there's a conspiracy brewing. What's worrisome is that even with him being given a fake name and everything, the MPs still knew what was going on. So whoever it is they're up against has some very, very long arms. As we jump to the presence, Levi echoes the same thing, but also notes an important detail. He was missing all of his nails, meaning that there's a very good chance he never talked. If you're into crime stories, this is the usual, their search history stopped on X, meaning they probably found what they were looking for. And by X, I of course mean the normal person interpretation of just unspecified thing and not Twitter, because who calls a social media platform X? If Nick didn't talk after his first nail got yoinked, well, he probably never talked. 
So, as it turns out, he is a bit of a mega chad. All of this also further explains why Aaron's entire squad is once again isolated and why Reiner and Burrito are currently our secondary concerns. Right now, we sort of have a target on our backs, from within. And to immediately solidify that worry, we get a message from Erwin basically saying to disappear at once and leave no trace behind. Erwin has been charged, there is a freeze on the scouts as a whole, and a formal request is now put in for Aaron and Astoria. In other words, they are getting very, very desperate. So again, the key, recapturing Shiganshina and all the basement mysteries all become secondary. Right now, we've got a literal conspiracy to deal with first, one that would almost result in the scouts losing their top commander. Everything following this point is with the one simple goal of yoinking Eren and Astoria. Which, by the way, yet again establishes a direct mirror to what we saw in Season 2. Since, you know, that's exactly what Reiner and Bertolt were doing. So for the 100th time, say it with me now, it is all a matter of perspective. The Big Bad Colossal is kinda doing the same thing as our own king, so is there really that big of a difference between them? Unlike Bertolt and Reiner, Rod never regretted any of it and he was ready to sacrifice his own daughter. A truly revolutionary discovery, monsters exist everywhere and blanket statements are bad. Who coulda thunk it? Unfortunately for the squad though, Kenny is already on their tail and we already hear that they have some backstory. An acquaintance of yours? An old one. We then jump on over to the mid cards, giving us some lore on the Titan bodies. Much of this is kind of recap on everything we already know. But the spine and all of that would of course be very important with a certain Reiner moment later in the season. Other than that though, nothing too groundbreaking this time around. We then jump on over to Trost where we see the first stage of their old switch Rue. First off, note the conversation between Sasha and Levi. Sasha immediately says, wow, they're handing out special rations, that is so generous. While Levi cuts back saying, it's not like they need all of them. It's just a matter of optics, they're trying to maintain a grasp on their population. And this is echoed as we cut to the throne room, where they basically say it might be relatively expensive, but they are just currently too close to the edge to risk outcries now. Like I mentioned before, illegitimate children and contenders to the throne are already very, very spooky. And that's not even addressing the whole wall religion secrets and the rumbling angle. So as of right now, we want people on our side and we want to paint the scouts and everything they do as pure evil. All of this is a matter of optics. And it's of course also here where we meet our big schemer Rod, who very explicitly says we need the power and the vessel. So with that, we have our next big confrontation all set up. And yes, the fact that he is basically saying the same exact thing as Reiner and Bertolt should be like a huge red flag. And also, also, the dude Hanji dealt with is back as well, very much spelling out that all of these events are directly connected. Back with the Levi squad, suddenly a caravan rides by and yoinks a blondie and a particular gentleman with brown hair. But it's of course not long until we learn that all of this is just a reverse Uno and that he actually yoinked Armin and good ol' Horseface. Okay, but real talk, we have to appreciate their dedication and restraint, because this guy right here, I mean, he deserves at least a couple Thunder Spears and the Wrath of our two Ackermans, like, yesterday. Weirdos aside, though, Mikasa and Levi both say that their time is running out and that they need to be quick. But Levi again says that something is fishy. These guys are amateurs. What's actually going on here is, of course, Levi's reverse Uno is being reverse Unoed again by his own teacher of old, Kenny. And also, side notes, the medieval fantasy-like music in this scene is really, really cool. And also, it's here where we see Sasha actually use the bow again. Though just before he leaves, Levi leaves Mikasa with a message. It's cut off for this episode, but later she tell the rest of their squad that this is no longer about Titans. This whole thing is evolving into a very real human threat. Again, in hindsight, all of this seems obvious. But in the world of Attack on Titan, thus far, we didn't really have any internal battles within the walls. I mean, sure, we had a few conflicts here and there between, like, individuals, but there was never any large-scale battle. Here, on the other hand, Levi is basically saying, wait, hold on, we might have gotten a little too close to the truth. Again, remember about that guy who got a little carried away while listening to Diggy Diggy Hole. And also, also, think back to the Season 2 finale and the information about the shifters being declassified. As in, it is no longer a divine judgment, all of this is our fellow man. Well, wouldn't you know it, that is now true in more ways than one. Because while that might have been talking about Marley, the same holds true for the MPs. I mean, all of them are just humans, right? You bet Isayama was being extra cheeky when he reveals that the true enemy are actually people, and then it's like, you know what, I'm gonna make the enemy your own people. Speaking of, we cut to the rooftop where Levi and Nifa are watching the road. 
And before you ask, yes, I was one of those people thinking, oh, so Nifa is now coming into the forefront, that's cool, can't wait to see how her character develops. I really should have learned after Mikkei, yes I know. Levi, of course, begins to quickly piece together that all of this has gone way too smoothly, and then drops the name of Kenny the Ripper. Nifa says to stop joking around, saying, sure, I've heard of him, but he's just an urban legend. As far as Kenny goes, we'll be talking plenty about him later on, but the simple way to think of him for now is just that everything he does is in pursuit of power. Sure, the Ackermans were once persecuted and all that, but at the end of the day, his ultimate goal was to get the Founding Titan. He got his title because slicing up a few MPs was merely a way to express that twisted desire for power. Plenty more on him soon. But one thing I love here is how the moment of, wait, it's all converging, is framed. The scene opens with dead silence, the two just chatting about the mission. Something's wrong. But as the pieces fall into place, this eerie, poor-like music fades into the background. You've heard of Kenny the Ripper? And as that high-pitched pinging noise rings out... <laughs> Once again, Levi is the last man standing, and in this episode, it is a double subversion. The episode doesn't end there, we don't fade into a new ED. No, Kenny casually says, long time no see, and we keep on going. Get ready for this, because I'll be losing my mind over the ODM gear animation next time as well. But even this small scene at the end is like, yep, you're still watching Attack on Titan. ODM gear is back on the menu. But also note that this is an inversion of the first OP. There, it was the human soldiers all soaring above the buildings, fighting Titans. They were becoming the hunters. This time, it is our fellow man, wielding some sort of weird guns and going after us. Yet again, the conflict has shifted and the truth becomes even muddier. And with that, that is the Season 3 premiere and Episode 38. Once again, a very bold opening to a season that definitely left me a little bit stunlocked on first viewing. Also, this ending bit here is the first part I'm recording with the entire series now complete, so I'm happy to say that finally we are all on the same page. All that said, next time we'll be talking about a certain scene that involves a Kenny and a Chase, talking plenty about the very ominous ED and the many Amir parallels, and generally nerding out a whole lot more than is healthy. So, I hope to see you back as we continue overanalyzing Attack on Titan. And that's the video. Oh, how I can't wait to dive into Season 3 and once again talk about Erwin's 3000 IQ plays. But anyway, with that, I want to say a massive thank you to our current patrons and YouTube members who allow me to produce even more of these for you all. Without you, there'd be a whole lot less of my ramblings, so seriously, thank you, thank you. Other than that, I want to say thank you very much for watching, I hope you have a great day, and hopefully, I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye